Hello. We're going to get started again now. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming back after the break. Um, so now we're really pleased to share with you um, a lens to the future of blockchains with our VC guest, moderated by Professor John Song. She's joined by Dan Robinson, of, who's head of research and a general partner at Paradigm, and Abakal Garg of Electric Capital, where he is the managing partner. So please join me in welcoming them. Ready, on. Great. Uh, I, was, I was apologizing for Dan that he gets lumped in with the VCs. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thanks a lot, Abishu, and, uh, and Dan, for joining us. Uh, really great to, to see you here again. Uh, thank you so much. So, so let's get started. Uh, so first, uh, uh, maybe just briefly, you can. I mean, you guys both have been uh, really veterans in the space. So maybe you can just briefly introduce yourself, uh, share with the audience here, uh, right, just briefly about sure. uh, your yeah, experience here. Mm -hmm. So I uh, actually started my career as a lawyer before be uh, quitting to become an engineer at a crypto startup. And uh, while working there, got involved in the open source protocol research community and uh, on ETH research and uh, uh, with you know people working on Plasma and uh, uh, early stages of DeFi. And through that, I uh, uh, ended up joining Paradigm um, uh, as, one, as the first research partner and have been there for five years, worked closely with the uh, rest of the investment team and the, and the portfolio, uh, including companies like Uniswap and Optimism. Um, my background is mostly as an entrepreneur, um, and so I started and sold two companies, uh, and uh, when we were doing our second company, it was uh, basically a way to orchestrate a lot of GPUs across a lot of different data centers, which turns out it's useful again 10 years later. Uh, and uh, while we were doing that, we, were, we came across a bunch of Bitcoin miners, and so we started doing some Bitcoin mining. Um, Totally misunderstood it. We thought it was a, initially a computational platform, like interested about the ability to like write code and ship it. Did not understand it as a potential store value at all. Decided that sucked and nobody would ever use it for that. And so we sold all our Bitcoin. Um, and then a couple of years later, we saw Ethereum and we said, oh, this is actually what we thought Bitcoin was five years ago. This, this is super cool. And so we sort of became enamored with that and started dabbling with that. And then um, just about five, five and a half years ago, uh, about the same time as Paradigm, we, we started up um, and uh, mostly do seed and Series A investing. Uh, tokens kind of across all sectors. So, uh, great, thank you. So, yeah, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, so, the blockchain space really changes really fast. One never gets bored <laughs> in the blockchain space. Um, it seemed, it felt like the Luna clubs, the FTX clubs, was just yesterday. Um, but already, there's so much new excitement in the blockchain space. Uh, so first, uh, could you uh, share a little bit, given the many years of experience you have in the space, what excites you now, and what excites you about the future in the space? So I, I can get excited about a lot of things. I think um, the lens through which I view a lot of stuff has been uh, fairly constant for the past, uh, since, since, since I joined the space, um, in that I think there's two trends that are really, uh, that are just going to keep improving and that, and that enable uh, everything else. And one is I think that the, is the scaling of the technology. And it just is, is, has been throughout blockchain's history incredibly true that uh, the, there's a lot of limits on what can actually be done with the existing, you know, with transaction costs, with latency, with the throughput that's currently supported. And so increasing that um, and decreasing, decreasing fees is probably the most important enabling technology for everything. And then I think in decentralized finance, where I've spent a lot of my time, I, I tend to think that uh, there's just you know, maybe you know, thousands of incremental improvements at every single step in order to just make the things that are currently going on in decentralized finance better. And just every one of those, I think, is, uh, is a major area of research and potentially a company. Um, and I, so I think just the long sort of uh, path to basically make order execution, uh, for example, or make uh, efficient, efficiency of lending protocols better, um, I think is still really fascinating. And so like these, these things, you know, the things that you could, you could just chart them, it takes a very long time. It's, it's, uh, when you zoom in, it's not going to look like, a, uh, like an asymptote. Um, or like a new unlock, but over time is going to be increasingly getting better. I think that to me is the is what excites me most. It's just being on this curve that's constantly going up. Um, not that dissimilar. I kind of have two thoughts. So one, there's a technical part to this, and then I think there's a social part to this. The technical part um, that sort of captured our attention is you know the, these systems make uh, a fundamentally different set of trade-offs than the internet. 
these systems essentially say, well, what if I'm willing to give up some speed and scalability and throughput, but what I want is uh, ownership of my data or censorship resistance or seizure resistance, um, what then? And our, our belief was that even though these systems were not that high throughput or that robust yet, that over time they would get better, and specifically that set of trade-offs where you really care about ownership of your data or immutability of data or um, censorship resistance, seizure resistance, but you're willing to give up some speed and scalability and throughput really matters when you're talking about money. So sort of our, our core area of focus for, for um, many years now has been what we call programmable money. We didn't coin that term, but you know I think people kind of know what that means is once you have digital stores of value and you can write code around them, you can recreate the entire financial system because most of the financial system is here's a pile of money, here's who has access to it, let me tell you what needs to happen with the cash flow in these assets over the next 5, 10, 20 years, right? That's REITs and HELOCs and mortgages and securities and derivatives and so on. So this is just a better technical infrastructure to recreate all of that rather than writing a bunch of legal code. You can write computer code um, and you can do that in a 24-7 global permissionless market, um, which if you look at the internet, you know, the internet created that for information and, and I think that, that this technology creates it for money. So that's the technical side. I think the social side is just as interesting, which is, um, there are a lot of people, I think, coming at this from different perspectives, but it's sort of, you know, uh, blind person and the elephant kind of situation. I think we're all sort of feeling around the same concept here. Um, and it just happens to be that a lot of technologists have converged on this, this view as well. Um, but I think um, society is broken in a lot of ways, and a lot of people see that. Um, and uh, whether that is the hollowing out of the middle class or wealth inequality, or you look at trust in public schools or trust in the press and the media or trust in the banks, like there's a lot of data you can look at now. And, and so a lot of people are sort of poking around and being like, wait, something, something broke. And if anybody knows like the infamous what happened in 1971, sort of like meme, like something broke. And I went, it's unclear when it broke exactly, but something broke. Um, and, uh, and I think what these technologies really offer is an opportunity to reimagine a lot of the the social infrastructure of society in a way that doesn't necessarily require the same trust assumptions that we've had uh, that have been baked into those institutions since World War II. Um, and so as much as this is a technical movement, I think it's a social movement where a lot of people are saying, actually, we need to reimagine some of these fundamental institutions in society, and we need to design them in such a way that we avoid the concentration of power um, and the consequences that come from that in the legacy systems, um, which worked really well from like post-World War II to, you know, like. 1980 or something, 1985, these systems worked really well, but then they kind of broke, and we need to reimagine them. And so policymakers are seeing that in, in various ways and trying to fix it, and um, writers are seeing that, and, and economists are seeing that, and technologists are seeing that. And I think this is the technologist's approach to, well, what if we could reimagine these systems in a way that, that removed those power centers and got rid of that concentration of power and structurally made it so that you couldn't? And that, that's a really interesting thought exercise, I think, is the technology allowing you to express this sort of like social belief system. Great, thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, so these ideas are really make um, uh, the blockchain technology really exciting and the space we are believe that uh, we hope that the future uh, will uh, have uh, will be built on this decentralized trust and so on. Um, and, and also even including in our own DeFi MOOC, like the first lecture I talk about why right, decentralized finance infrastructure actually makes sense, can significantly simplify the entire uh, right, finance infrastructure stack. Um, but however, if we look at the adoption, um, again, so in the earlier panel we talked about, uh, briefly talked about like blockchain versus AI, how things, uh, they are both really fast evolving uh, space, but also very different. So if we look at, for example, the adoption in AI, um, the kind of numbers that we are talking about, so for example, Midjourney is the largest, uh, has a la largest Discord server, and the OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT ha has the uh, it's the fastest growth uh, app, uh, which grew to 100 million users in two months. Uh, so this is the kind of numbers we are talking about in the AI space, and we can look at numbers in the blockchain space as well. So so the question is, um, what do you think? How will adoption in the blockchain space uh, move forward? Uh, what will really drive you know, this, the kind of adoption that we see in the AI space, in the blockchain space, uh, which areas will be adopted first, second, and what makes a difference between adoption speed and, uh, and the breadth in the blockchain space versus the AI space, for example? Uh, sort of a, a lame answer um, or an excuse for, for our space, 
that I, I don't think it is uh, likely at any point to be sort of a, a story like the adoption of, of mobile, um, which was just incredibly fast, or the adoption of, um, or of something like ChatGPT. Um, I think it's more, you know, as, as a inherently a multiplayer technology, um, where you really do need other people to be um, to be on the same one in order to uh, to use it, and we're adopting that. Is there's like some significant cost of switching over the system? I think it's more similar to something like the early days of the email of email or the internet, where you just have this like very slow but constantly rising tide. Um, and I think that's uh, you know that, that that's something where you have to be fairly patient for it. That said, you know I, I do think we're starting to see we're starting to get to reach a point where like actually you can see faster growth of. Um, of the technology, and you know, in some uh, in some applications, because of because of more uh, you know cheaper stablecoin um, uh, transfers on layer two, things like that. But I'd also say it's not inherently number of users may not be the right uh, metric. And I think for for crypto, I would rather be looking at dollars um, dollars in the system or, or dollar transfer potentially, which again I think has has uh, been has, has been a, a more impressive story if you look at it that way. Yeah. Plus plus one to that last comment. So two. Two or three thoughts, maybe really quickly. So one, I think there's this adage, um, which startup people know, uh, but bears repeating, which is people tend to dramatically overestimate what's possible in two years and dramatically underestimate what's possible in 10 years. Um, and there's just some human cognitive biases that produce that sort of intuition. Um, so, you know, like the world was pretty different in AI in 2014, right, 10 years ago. Uh, when was ImageNet, like 12, 13? Uh, open AI, I think it started in 15. Um, and so like, it takes a while. And so I think a lot of the like basics of this technology are kind of like 2017 ish, like 2016, 2017 ish is kind of, you know, I think you could start saying, okay, what happens in 10 years? And I think most people just are too optimistic about how quickly these things will happen. But when they tip, they like, they really tip really, really, really quickly. Um, and I think we're starting to get to that point. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's an easy out in some sense, and so ask me again in five years, but I would not be surprised if in the next couple of years you sort of start to see some of those tipping points. Um, one data point of evidence here might just be like if you look at the number of registered users on Coinbase or you look at the number of users who hold um, some sort of US dollar stable coin um, and how quickly those things can grow, um, especially in, in an up market. Okay, so that's one set of observations. T timing is always tricky, but generally people underestimate what's possible in 10 years and are sort of too short-term optimistic. Um, and, and these things really require patience. Another good example is like self-driving. Like I was a seed investor in a company called Cruise. You actually have self-driving cars now, but that was 2014, right? It was about 10 years. And people got way over their skis, and even by like 2017, people were like, this is never gonna happen. Um, and here we are 10 years later, and it's actually happening. Uh, you can actually take a self-driving car. So um, something like that I think it bears repeating. Okay, second thought is there's an interesting question here of um, what does it mean to be a user? And I think this is what partly what Dan is getting at is like, um, I actually think the US dollar is a consumer use case. Um, and there are many, many millions of users in the world that, that want dollars, that can't get dollars today, and this is the easiest way to get dollars. There's a great irony, I think, if anybody knows, uh, Elon has this sort of saying, it's like the funniest outcome is the most likely or the most ironic outcome is the most likely. And I think it's just kind of ironic that maybe the killer use case for this stuff is the US dollar, given what Satoshi's intentions were when he started this. Um, it's kind of funny that that might be the killer use case. Um, but yeah, I think like, one to three billion people want dollars. You can now text somebody some dollars, um, and it's just a cryptographic hash, and there's nothing any government can do to stop it, and that's pretty powerful, actually, without shutting off the internet. Um, and so there's this question of, like, how do you find a user here? And I think you can make an argument that, actually, um, you might already be at something like 50 million users, um, because all these people using Tether. Like, if you look at the data, people may not realize this, but if you look at USDT plus USDC, I think it's at an all-time high right now. Like, it's actually bounced back from 21, 22. Um, and I would not be surprised if over the next year to two years you get to something like a couple hundred million users of, of US dollar stable coins because so much of the world wants dollar stable coins. Like if you look at, take, take something like Nigeria, the Naira was pegged to the dollar, they sort of broke the peg officially, you got like 40% inflation in a couple of months um, and all these people are hosed. All of those people would much rather have dollars um, and, and now they can get them. So that's kind of the second observation is I think um, the way we as Americans often think about users is sort of from our lens. and. And we don't really, uh, most people who are Americans don't actually understand the dollar. Um, and I think that's actually a killer consumer use case. The third thing I'll note is um, it's possible that it's not through DeFi that you get consumer adoption, but it's through NFTs. Um, and if you look at kind of where volumes are today on NFTs, I think um, uh, 
we, we launched a small data site called nftpulse.org, and you could just go look at the numbers. But, um, you know, we're not back at transaction volume numbers that we were in 21, you know, like billions of dollars a week in transaction volume. But if you like at revenue numbers, we're actually doing really well. And it's because the Bitcoin NFT ecosystem really took off with ordinals. And, um, and those have fees. Um, and so if you look at marketplaces like Magic Eden, um, where Paradigm and Electric are, are both investors, um, just disclosure, um, you know, they're doing record numbers. Um, and if you look at those numbers in terms of like revenue numbers, uh, they're bigger than eBay was at IPO. Um, it's just like, I think we've forgotten what an early market looks like. So you can go back and read like the S1 prospectus from eBay in like 1996. Um, and these NFT marketplaces are doing way more GMV, gross merchandise volume, and revenue than, than some of these marketplaces were in 96. But nobody in like 96, 97 that looked at those numbers thought that, that um, those things weren't real. It really is a question of like, what is the forward-looking compound growth rate? Like, can you, can you sustain forward-looking growth? So I, I would argue, actually, we, we probably have something like a GPT-2. If you look at like the NFT market right now, there's like a decent number of people that are like, hey, this is real. Um, and now it's really a question of what does that growth rate look like going forward for the next three years? One issue is arguably I think crypto has grown too fast at several yeah. points in its history. And that uh, NFT sort of had a going mainstream yeah. moment in, in 2021. Yeah. Um, and when it was probably before they were ready for it. Yeah. And like a lot of the time, a lot more money has ended up flowing into crypto faster than it would have been in any other. This, this is also a really good tech, point. Tech cycle. Yeah, I really agree with that. I think there's, um, because so much of the use case does involve moving money around, I think so much money flows into this space um, before the tech is ready, or before the infrastructure is ready, or before the user experience is ready, or before the companies are ready. And so the di degree of difficulty, I think, that founders have to deal with in this space is, is just, it's next level. Um, like operationally, uh, how you have to deal with running a business is just so much harder in this space than other spaces um, because of this. Because all of a sudden you can go from zero dollars in revenue to like $200 million run rate in three months. And then 18 months later, you're back at like 8 million run rate. It's just like the volatility in the business is so crazy um, because because uh, the internet's wired up now, right? So it's just like the money can flow so quickly. Um, but actually, uh, often I think works to the detriment. Yeah, cause it's an interesting thought exercise. Like if we were in the mid-90s right now, there just wouldn't be that many people on the internet and there wouldn't be that much money flowing. And so relative to how many people are here, the expectations would be way, way lower. It's just like everybody can now see that this is happening and then billions of dollars can flow in really quickly. So the expectations get totally out of whack with what's possible with the tech. And so it's, it's a little bit sort of unfair to the technology um, and, and the technologists who are building because that has its own pace. You can't like do 10 years of research in a year. It just takes, it just takes 10 years. Great, great. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for sharing the perspectives. I think uh, these are really valuable uh, for the audience. Um, so next, um, I think uh, Dan also briefly touch on the DeFi space. I think DeFi space is one of the first uh, and uh, definitely it's a key uh, area in blockchain. And um, you know, earlier we had DeFi summer, we had this explosive growth in DeFi. Um, and a lot of innovations happened in DeFi. So, so can you talk a little bit in terms of what you see as next steps and also in the future? Are we seeing, you know, most of the, you know, the big innovations have already been done. It's mainly just incremental improvements, like you said, like a thousand uh, maybe small improvements just to get things up there. Or you see there are still significant uh, innovation missing. And so what do you see in five years, like where the DeFi space is going to be like? In, in the interest of like allowing myself to be proven horribly wrong, <laughs> um, I will say I think for the most part, I think we know what people will be doing and what, what the core functions of DeFi will be. Um, and this is in some permutations, uh, trading assets, uh, borrowing against assets, and um, uh, and using synthetic assets, or, or uh, and or including stable coins, um, those to me, and, and like maybe a couple others that are kind of in the in the same realm of, of use cases, are in, those are likely to be. This is the subject of decentralized finance going forward, and that's partly because I think it it matches roughly the the uh, substance of centralized finance, um, but you know it, with 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 its own quirks. Uh, so I'm I'm, you know, when people say like, oh, I. I, I like brand new like DeFi primitive or something like very often they're just remixing the same ingredients. But then I think that's a I think that's that's okay. 
Uh, and B, I think there's a ton of revolution to be had in how those things are done. I think we're nowhere close to the final form for, for how decentralized exchanges work, for how decentralized lending works. Um, and so I think the space is wide open for, for huge improvements in it. Um, and hopefully some of that will, I think, still come from, the, from people who have already been active in the space. But I think a lot of it will come from new players of the space. Um, and I think, so I would just say, like, you, if you're going into, if you're interested in like going into DeFi, you shouldn't be saying like, oh, you know, like it's all already picked over and like I need to find something completely new and different. It's like there's just a thousand x improvement in how things are done to be had. Um, one way to think about this, and generally speaking, in markets, is um, kind of like we we're talking about. People underestimate what's possible in ten years. The, the reason for that is that these markets tend to grow exponentially, and humans have really bad intuitions for exponential growth, as evidenced by COVID. Um, and it's partly because just as like macro biological entities, we don't experience that. And, you know, like go to sleep one day and then there's a tree outside your window that wasn't there yesterday. That's just like, that's not how biology works. It obviously at a microbiology scale does work that way with bacteria, but that's not our intuition. So like our primate brains don't know how to handle exponential growth. Um, but these markets are exponential. And it, it often feels absurd to stand a mo at a moment in time and then look forward and extrapolate exponentially because the numbers feel absurd. But actually, if you look at the history of software, like at every moment in time, that was actually the right thing to do. Like you should have stood in like 1998 and extrapolated exponentially and you would have gotten to like Amazon is going to be a trillion dollar company, but you would have sounded like a raging crazy person. Like you might as well be standing on the street corner like yelling, right? It's just like you'd sound like a total crazy person saying that. Um, but that was actually the right answer. Um, and so what that means today is if you just think about how many people are here and how many dollars are here, if you extrapolate forward, like these, these protocols are like one one thousandth as big as they'll be, um, just given exponential growth and how many people will come and how many dollars will come and so on, right? Um, and, and there's, you know, you look at Facebook, look at YouTube, look at NVIDIA, like just these markets often are, are much, much, much bigger than people anticipate. So that's kind of, I think, part of the reason why is our intuitions around exponential growth are not very good. The other thing I'll note is I think that um, another... Like, as you can tell, I spent a lot of time thinking about, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about the process of thinking because so much of what we need to do is make sure that we're making good decisions for the right reasons. There's another really interesting um, sort of limitation of, I think, human humans, which is we're really bad at these sort of combinatorial problems where, where you have these like sort of chaotic systems and trying to figure out how a bunch of things intersect with each other and the consequences of that, we're just not good at that. I can like sort of intersect two things and think about some second order effects or third order effects. I can't really do three things. And so like what happens when crypto intersects with AI, intersects with AR, VR? I like have no idea. Um, and, and, and we're opening this like surface, especially with AI agents, um, that I think is really unprecedented and interesting. The last time I think we did something like this m was roughly the invention of the corporation in the mid 1800s. Uh, actually, the corporation was invented like 1640, but um, like joint stock corporations. But sort of like the unlock was governments letting you start a corporation. You didn't have to go to the king and say, "Hey, please give me a charter to start a corporation." I could just like file some paperwork and start a corporation. Um, and that like really upended society in a lot of ways because it forces a lot of questions, which we're I think now going to grapple with, which is like, well, what is the jurisdiction of a corporation? Like, does it live in a state? Like how does how does identity work for a corporation versus a human? Like I know you, I know you know, John, you know you live down the street from me. I know you, but what does it mean to like have identity for a corporation? How does like liability work for a corporation? Um, like does that flow through the person? Like how does uh, risk work? How you know there's like you know, how does um, using your money for political purposes work as a corporation? There's like a bunch of consequences downstream, and now we're now we're like 200 years later, kind of faced with the same problems, but for AIs. Um, with the added complexity that the jurisdiction is now the internet, which means they don't really live in a place. So as far as like any single government is concerned, um, there's that, that much more complexity. Um, uh, and so I think like we're opening up a surface area here that's gonna intersect with crypto, probably not in the next two to four years, but maybe like seven to 10 years, that I think is gonna make a lot of stuff super weird. I'll give you a really concrete example with, with DeFi. Um, people have tried to do micropayments on the internet for a long time, and it just never worked, because I think humans are not good at micropayments. It's like, it feels weird for me to pay like 0 .006 cents for some article on the internet to some blog. Um, but maybe micropayments are like the right interface for, for AIs, because like machines can do micropayments and they understand micropayments. And so if you need to like meter some sort of service, like pay as you go for some API may not be so crazy. Um, and so I think there's actually gonna be some surface area that opens up over the next five to 10 years, which is because like the customers may not be humans anymore that actually like DeFi actually, that's like a big unlock for like a thousand X because there's just a bunch of new financial stuff that needs to happen where, where at least one of the two counterparties and maybe two out of the two counterparties um, or multiple counterparties are no longer humans. Great, great, thank you. Um, 
And uh, so, so we talked about uh, DeFi as an application area. Um, so now let's also uh, briefly touch on the infrastructure space. So similar to DeFi, you know, during the DeFi summer, there was a lot of innovation. And in the infrastructure space, also, there has been a lot of innovation. Uh, there's a lot of L1s be, uh, that was built, and then there's L2s, and then the people now talk about L3s. And then also, right on Bitcoin, also there has been a lot of recent uh, exciting development as well. So what do you think about the infrastructure space uh, in blockchain? Do you think similarly, like most of the pieces are there, we, it's just uh, incremental improvements, are, are there still significant uh, uh, Piece is missing. What do you think? Uh, how the space is going to be like in five years? Dan, I like it when you go first because it gives me a minute to think. Okay. I'll go. I'll go first. Here. I'll go first. I'll give you a minute. Um, so there's the, there's this feedback loop that happens, right? Which is people create applications and then they stress this, the infrastructure, and all of a sudden people say, "Oh, the infrastructure is broken," and so then we got to go, go build better infrastructure, and then and then a bunch of really smart engineers and researchers and scientists go off and build way better infrastructure, and then they launch it, and then people soak up all of that. Uh, bandwidth and capacity and you know, computational power, whatever it is. And this is part of the reason why, there's other reasons too, but this is part of the reason why my computer today is slower than it was 10 years ago, even though it's like 10,000 times more powerful. It's just like, I don't understand, right? But it's like all the resources, all the RAM, all the compute, everything just got to get sucked up, right? And, and gets used. Um, I think we're right now just about to hit a big unlock with a bunch of new infrastructure hitting. Like the L2s are hitting, there's like decentralized sequencers are going to hit, Eigenlayer is just about to go live, like DA is just gone live. It's like a bunch of components that just went live. Um, over, literally like over the last three to six months and some that are going to launch over the next three to six months. So I think we probably unleash a lot of really interesting new innovation that soaks up a lot of that. And then we'll be back on this part of the cycle where people will say, oh, everything is broken. Like it's just too slow and clunky and it's congested and yada, yada. Now we got to go fix it. And so then some really good smart people will identify where the bottlenecks are and try to fix it. Some of those will be incremental. Some of those will be user experience wins. Some of those will be um, like material major breakthroughs. Um, uh, but it, to me, this is like this is just computation. This is just like a never-ending thing. Uh, it's like every three years we need new infrastructure. You throw out the old code base and build a new code base. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I have much to add. I, I think the very rickety and limited state of crypto right uh, infrastructure right now is probably the most incredibly bullish thesis for the industry yeah, because the fact that everything that has happened in it is possible on these very rickety rails. Um, is, real, is impressive and shows how much demand there is to crawl over glass in order to use this kind of technology. Um, and then I think it's also one of the biggest opportunities. Uh, as I talked about before, I think just uh, if you see a way to increase the, the scale, or, you know, again, like we had actually a lot of scale increase in the last, uh, you know, in like, in like uh, 2020, 21, 21, the last time you had saw an increase in usage. Um, but a lot of it is on, you know, it's on like independent L1s that launched, right? Or it's in ways, uh, on things that like are, are really difficult to use. Um, so uh, advances in interoperability, advances in uh, UX are, I think, also part of that uh, the advancing and, and ultimately scaling. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's I think it's really uh, yeah I think it's probably the biggest opportunity. I'm um, just trying to try to figure out how to make how to make blockchain scale, and I think there's still just a lot of room in it. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, so now let's move to the the last question. We talked about uh, decentralization and AI, the two different spaces. Uh, and of course, uh, there's a lot of excitement at the intersection, at least people try to make excitement at the intersection <laughs> between the two as well. Um, so uh, yeah, could you share your thoughts about uh, you know, this two, the relationship between these two spaces, how different they are, and what you think may be exciting in the uh, at the intersection of the two, are you think it's mostly just hype, uh, this uh, <laughs> decentralization and AI space? Uh, also, also in the uh, interest of again showing myself, making a concrete prediction that that would be wrong. I think the the like very unique intersection of crypto and AI is going to take a while to play out. In part because I think both technologies are really early. People have been experimenting with AI agents for crypto, but that's like. By far, the easiest way to lose all your money immediately <laughs> is to give is to give access to a wallet to a to an LLM and shallow to try to do something. Um, I think neither neither area of tech is really ready for um, for the intersection of it to be you know to be even like stable or, or able to do something. I think there's a lot of ways in which um, uh, AI is an enabling technology for crypto, and like the most prosaic is uh, as a horizontal technology just for building 
Um, and so like, I, I write a lot more code much faster because uh, you can use Copilot now. Um, I think uh, you know, there's ways maybe AI can be used to, uh, to help uh, find bugs in smart contracts. Uh, and I think there's, there's, there's uh, interesting uh, possible sort of specific technologies there. But that's something that AI is really doing for the entire tech industry. And then I think crypto as an enabling technology for AI um, with having uh, being able to like make payments to someone in order to to use an AI model, right? Like the same thing, the same things that crypto does for everything, working uh, doing for AI. So both of these, you know, as I think there'll be customers in each in one industry for products of the other. Um, but you know, in terms of decentralized AI, my view is I think technology is inherently decentralized for the most part. Uh, by default, it's pretty hard to keep technology in a box, um, and two people can use it the same technology uh, independently. Um, it's you know it's it's non-rivalrous, and so for the most part, you know, with with uh, some exceptions, like that's been the historical state of technology. I think the the novelty of of crypto wasn't that it was like oh this is the first time we have decentralized technology. It was decentralizing something consensus that had previously been thought to be basically impossible to decentralize. It's like this is the one thing you need centralization for. But in fact, like Bitcoin and Ethereum as technologies are kind of centralized. They're saying like we all have to be using the same ledger. You all have to use this one in order to interact with each other. And I think for the most part, AI is not like that. You don't need to reach consensus on an AI in order to use it. You can just like have your own AI, um, or you can you can uh, use it sort of independently. And so like I think there's there's an awkward fit in trying to like say decentralize AI, where often people trying to do it are ending up making it basically having to fit it into this model. We make it more centralized in order to like fit it on a blockchain. Um, and I think you should avoid trying to do that. Yeah, a couple of things I generally agree with that. I think uh, Don, your specific question, um, I think like ninety percent hype. 95% hype. It's mostly hype right now. Very reminiscent of the ICO bubble, very reminiscent of the AI bubble. Uh, most of the stuff is not going to work, but it's a good way to raise money from people who don't think that deeply about these things. Um, so you get sort of opportunists that come out and take advantage of that. Um, now, that being said, I do think plus one to everything that is sort of like these these two ecosystems are, are customers of each other's technologies. So like cryptography, it's like, okay, well, if you're gonna have deep fakes and you kind of want to have like a cryptographic signature for every video that the White House produces so that, um, you know, you can't have some, uh, yeah, like here, you know, it's not gonna be like uh, President Biden says we're dropping a nuke, you know, somewhere. It's gonna be more like, oh, it looks like he's kind of having a stroke, something you're like, ah, uh, maybe, you know, and then that's gonna get leaked and then you had to like debunk that somehow. Um, and, uh, and so then you say, oh, what well, you need like some sort of cryptographic signature, and then you're like, well, I really you want the social networks to be able to read that thing, so you probably want to publish it to some like open database that anybody can read from, uh, not just to whitehouse.gov, and then you're like, you really want that thing to be like immutable with like a really high cost, and you're like, oh, you're like kind of inventing a blockchain type of a system, right? So like as a customer of these technologies, it makes sense that like AI systems will need these things. And then kind of back to this idea of AI agents as entities, like a non-human, non-business entity that we have not yet sort of gotten our heads around. Um, it opens up a lot of interesting questions, like probably KYC for an AI is going to be some sort of cryptographic-based system. It's not not going to be a social security number or a TIN that, like, you know, the state of Delaware issues you. Um, you know, it's uh, probably the case that you have to think about how, like, payments work to these things in a non-jurisdictional way. They need command line wallets because they can't walk into a bank and get a bank account, right? So, like, a lot of the sort of, like, AI agents kind of stuff, I think, 10 years from now, super interesting. Um, the other thing I'll note is um, I think that... One sort of conceptual um, model for this stuff too is that um, I think Dan's right that a lot of this AI stuff is decentralized by its very nature. And there's a really interesting like game theoretic thing happening here, which is people around the world have realized that some of these kinds of technologies are actually national security assets. So like a GPU is a munition, right? In, in like in, in, in the internet. Um, and you gotta be really careful about who has GPUs, and you gotta be really careful about who has data centers, and you have to be careful about who has uh, foundational models. And there are these sort of like really interesting geopolitical questions that come out of this. So for example, let's say you're a country in the Gulf, um, and maybe you're not a Sharia law country, but you have like deep roots um, in, in Sharia law. Um, do you really want a foundational model that's been trained by a bunch of tech bros in SF on a bunch of American propaganda? Probably not. Um, right, so there's actually a very natural decentralizing force here, which is like these things are being thought of in, in the modern post-internet era as, as munitions and tools for national security, which creates a massive decentralizing force. But then that does open up a bunch of surface area because it's not likely going to be just three companies that win, right? Like every Gulf state needs its own models. 
Um, the, the Nordics will have their own thing. Like Singapore will need to do its own thing. India is going to do its own thing. And so you end up with like actually a very fragmented market. And one of the things that these technologies are good at is this sort of interop. Um, and so a lot of the tooling that we've created here in terms of like moving money around or assets or you know, in this sort of global context is, a, is a, actually a very good fit if you assume that the AI landscape is going to be very, very fragmented because of the geopolitics of it all. It's like a very natural fit to slot in um, as an adjacency as well. Um, yeah, so there's some thoughts. Great, thank you. I think, uh, I mean, it's such a stimulating conversation. I'd love to have it uh, continue, but uh, I know we are running out of time. Uh, so with that, uh, let's thank our uh, esteemed uh, uh, panelists. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.